one thing um, when you know you play those parlor games about if you could have dinner with someone, you know, would it be the Dalai Lama or Eleanor Roosevelt or whomever? You know, one thing I want to know is what were the factors in your either uh, ancestry or upbringing or some combination of phenotype and genotype that led you to become interested in the work you've done with the Native Americans, First Nations, um, Inuits, and other tribal peoples. So if we could go back to the very beginning and you decide what that means for these purposes, I'd love to hear what the influences were that brought you to the threshold of your professional life. Okay, it's interesting the question you ask. Um, the At least the uh, most of the tribes, I don't know about all, uh, at least many of them, uh, people introduce themselves by saying, I'm from this family or this clan uh, and that clan on my mother's side and my father's side and my grandmother is and my father, and etc. Uh, as a way of people um, sort of placing them, and especially in uh, situations where uh, lots of people know um, large numbers of families. It places them. Um, and on occasion, uh, when I've been asked to uh, speak to a tribal community, I do something similar, except no one would know who my family is. But I talk about uh, the values uh, that uh, went into uh, from my family. Um, and uh, it's sort of my equivalent way of, of doing it. Um, and <clears throat> the, my father was uh, the youngest of 13, I think, um, uh, Jews f who left Russia, flew, uh, uh, immigrated from Russia at the very first part of the wave. Um, after the pogroms of 1880. Uh, they were the, uh, the first ones uh, in that very first wave and settled uh, in Winthrop, what is now Winthrop, Massachusetts. I assume it was that, it may have been that too. Um, and uh, with uh, my grandmother's, uh, had two daughters. And the rest of the family was bought, uh, excuse me, was raised here in the U.S. Um, and my father was the youngest. Um, he had an accident, apparently, uh, with um, uh, either motor uh, vehicle accident or something um, that uh, severely injured his left leg and caused osteomyelitis. And this is uh, at the turn of the 1900s, so it'd be around 1910, 1915 perhaps, uh, long before antibiotics, and osteomyelitis and uh, 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 an infection of the bone is pretty severe and life-threatening, uh, but they were able to control it with surgery, so he had a permanently scarred uh, leg. I don't know if that was why he went into medicine or not. I never asked him, and now it's too late. I wish I had. Um, but he did go to medicine, um, and he entered, uh, uh, he was accepted by Boston University School of Medicine. Um, and that was at a time when medical schools had quotas against Jews. And not only was he admitted, he had a scholarship. Um, his one of his older sisters also uh, worked her, literally, uh, almost, uh, fingers off. Uh, all the money that she made, um, or as much as could be, went to his education. Um, and <clears throat> he never forgot that. Um, and I grew up... Um, was born in Worcester, Massachusetts. We moved to Fall River. Uh, he had established the first blood bank in Western Massachusetts. He was a pathologist. Um, he then established uh, something similar in Southeast Massachusetts, when, in Fall River, and also uh, worked in Newport. Every um, Wednesday afternoon, 
he would take the long drive, and it was a long drive by uh, time. Uh, uh, Route 24 was no, not in existence. It was a three-lane highway, would you believe, uh, 138. Uh, the third lane was both sides could pass, um, uh, the, whichever direction uh, started first. Uh, it was pretty interesting. But they're going through all the towns. He went up to Boston University and taught medical school students. Um, and that was his, uh, probably in the old days, would be called payback. This was what's now called pay forward uh, for that scholarship. When his sister, who had worked so long for him that she became uh, of unmarriageable unmar age, she uh, was too old to get married, uh, and she was a pill, by the way. She was uh, a favorite one of ours with a few, I won't go into some of the quirks she had that were adorable. Uh, when she developed uh, ovarian cancer, he, of course, brought her home to our home. And, uh, took care of her. So I don't, it was, I don't remember being told or discussed uh, anything, uh, but it was just the way I was to pay forward. Um, and I was a privileged person, obviously. Um, and uh, the first sort of pay forward um, was in 1959 in the summer uh, after first year of uh, college, uh, went to be involved with in St. Louis in a work study program, was involved with CORE as well, Congress of Racial Equality uh, in the sit-ins. That was bef the year before the college sit-ins began. Um, and uh, I was, I looked a lot younger than I was, but I was also young in any case, uh, and was picked out by the owner of the Howard Johnson's restaurant to uh, try to browbeat, which didn't work. But um, And the next year went to uh, Memphis on another work study program. It was organized by the um, uh, some ministers there. It was the first interracial anything in Memphis. Memphis was a tough city. Even Jackson, Mississippi had an integrated restaurant at the airport. Nothing was integrated in Memphis. Um, this was actually the first integrated anything that anyone had. It was forced uh, black students, African-American uh, young people from Memphis, and then a bunch of white people, some from the north, some from uh, a couple, I think, from Memphis, and uh, more from the south, but not Memphis. And uh, that was 19, the summer of 1960. The college sit-ins had already begun. Um, they were happening in Memphis. You would not know it from reading the newspaper. Um, the newspapers uh, in those days were propaganda sheets, not uh, at least in Memphis. Um, but it turned out that one of the four African-American participants was also involved in the sit-ins. Um, which he didn't tell anyone. Um, but I stayed on a little bit longer for uh, make some more money in the work. Um, and um, he asked me, do you want to participate in the sit-ins? I said, sure. Uh, I was the first white person in that group. All the other sit-ins, by the way, did ha were mixed, uh, obviously predominantly African-American, but uh, there was usually some, you know, some white people. Not in Memphis. So I was the first one, and since I was white, I, I was a scout, uh, which meant I could I'd go to the place where the sit-in was going to be and just sort of sit around um, and report back when the uh, uh, sit-iners arrived and what happened and uh, report back to the uh, lawyers that would spring them out of jail and this kind of stuff. So I was finally asked, well, gee, do you want to actually not be a scout, but be one of, you know, participate in one. Sure. And it was a pray-in. I won't talk about which church we went to, um, <clears throat> other than there was the uh, church of the president of the Southern Baptist Convention that year, who was also 
leading the charge against Kennedy as a Catholic to be elected. Um, and uh, we were met by a hospitality committee um, that, uh, that obviously planned this, uh, were anticipating it, and they were going to take us, they took us to a vacant parking lot to beat the bejesus out of us, but luckily the police arrived, uh, and I was thrown in jail. White jail, of course. And I was not dumb enough to, when asked by the <laughs> winos that, <laughs> that were in the jail cell with me, what I was there for, I, you know, I uh, gave a nondescript answer. Um, so the lawyers eventually uh, sprung us that afternoon. I called my father from uh, Memphis to Swansea, Massachusetts. Uh, we did not need a telephone uh, <laughs> to, to talk. I think I could have heard him without. Uh, he was irate with me. However, he was very proud of me. Uh, at the hospital. He was obviously concerned about my safety, um, as it was. Um, and that actually got me into both of those experiences into cross-cultural issues. And um, I was actually uh, involved in the black community there. Went to Africa the next summer, Operation Crossroads Africa. Then after graduation, the Peace Corps. Uh, urban Community Development in Colombia, um, and uh, it sounds strange, I know, but uh, uh, the uh, special U.S. Army Special Forces, the Green Berets, actually tried to recruit a whole bunch of Peace Corps volunteers, um, uh, especially to go to uh, uh, Special Forces Group 8, which was on the Canal Zone, because we were fluent in Spanish. Um, and actually, uh, uh, I, I like that idea, but wanted to go to Vietnam. That was in 65, when the buildup was just beginning. And my concern was to, um, I, I could work um, uh, fighting the communists. Uh, the Kennedy, people forget that Kennedy had two pet organizations, Peace Corps, which he founded, and the U.S. Army Special Forces, Green Berets. Um, and um, so that was a Cold War liberal, and I did that. and went to Nam for two years. Um, it also got me into medicine, because I went to Nam. as I went into Special Forces as a uh, chose medic. You had to choose one of four specialties. And even though my father was a doctor, and he was very disappointed, I did not go into... Uh, science uh, as an undergrad and into med school thereafter. Um, I did become a medic and that actually got me just excited about medicine and, uh, and what I could do, including preventive psychiatry. So I did pre-med science and after I got out of the army and went to US, uh, University of Washington School of Medicine as an old I was the oldest person in the class. They never had actually admitted anyone as old as I was. Um, now it's common, but uh, back then. And uh, that first year, uh, I, I was an independent duty medic. I actually functioned like a physician where there was not going to be a physician. We had a long, long training to diagnose and treat, do minor surgery. Uh, this kind of stuff. So first year medical school with all the basic science, I had a framework to put it in. I, I knew what the utility was. A lot of students didn't. So I had actually had free time and uh, took a course on um, a political science of uh, medical care. Uh, and it involved a, um, a small town practice uh, a small town with several practices. <clears throat> and one of the practices uh, was for the Swinomish Reservation and the uh, Indian Reservation. Um, and I had never been involved with Indians before, uh, American Indians, and there were no Indians, I thought, in Massachusetts growing up. I since have learned wrong. Um, we went all that far from the Mashpee and the Wampanoags, but, you know, uh, didn't know about it at the time, and, and um, that got me interested in Indians. 
uh, and in particular that group. And I felt um, that's really what I wanted to, to go into. Um, and in all of that, up to that time, it was, I, I think, uh, being active in a way that was assisting other people who didn't have the privilege I had to, um, to enable them to do what they wanted to do. Um, and again, part of, I think, just what I, the way I was brought up uh, without, I cannot remember a single conversation about it. Um, and that got me into uh, both family medicine because that was what was needed in the Indian Reservation. That first summer of med school, the, the course was in the winter, of the first year, I actually worked for the Swinomish Reservation. And, you know, here's this white guy, goes to the Swinomish Reservation to the chair, who's an older person, chair of the tribe. So, you know, I can, uh, I've got a scholarship, I can work for you. Um, talk about uh, expecting to, <laughs> to get in. Uh, but in fact, they, I think in retrospect, uh, I would recognize that they were probably watching me for a couple of months to see what I did. And then, in fact, they asked me to uh, do a survey about health. One of the things, and this is, I know this sounds dragged out, but there's a particular end to that story, um, which I think also was what I tried to do in the Indian Health Service and thereafter, after my retirement. Um, there was a white head of the uh, CAP program, Community Action Program, um, an uh, older woman, and also the public health nurse that came twice a month from the county health department to work on the Swinomish Reservation. There's something called the CHR, Community Health Representative, which is sort of like an interface between the patients uh, and the population uh, and the medical care system. Um, and she had a problem with alcohol. Now, she was actually not all that ineffective. She was fairly effective. But yes, yeah, she had a problem with alcohol and she had could have been more effective. Uh, if she had not, probably. So they called the meeting. And they called me doctor, by the way, since I was a medical student. Um, with the chair and the um, vice chair of the reservation. And the doctor uh, in Anacortes that uh, I had originally gotten involved with uh, in uh, the winter, that winter quarter who was the doctor who cared for most of the Indians uh, at, on the Swinomish Reservation. And the purpose, they told me, was to convince Tandy Wilbur, that was his name, uh, Tandy Wilbur Sr., a very actually prominent uh, Indian leader for decades, convince him to fire this woman. Okay, so uh, we go there, it was a lunchtime meeting at the hospital, and the doctor asked what's going on, and I said, just, just, just watch. So they made their case, one after the other, of uh, what was wrong with this person, and it would be so much better to get another person. And then they asked me what I thought, expecting me, of course, to be an ally. And I said, you know, uh, I don't know all the problems and the best way to solve the problems on the Indian Reservation, on the Swinomish. I trust the judgment of the chairman. Uh, and uh, I think he will make, he knows more than any of us all those things that has to uh, go into leading a community. Uh, and I think he'll make the right decision. Well, needless to say, the uh, two Anglos there were pretty upset. 
Um, and, but then they asked Dr. Clear, and he said, I agree with Bill Freeman, uh, and that was the end of the meeting. The two women left first, Dr. Clear left second, um, and that left me with Tandy and his wife. And um, and there was no one else in the room as we were walking out, and he said two words, thank you. Three years later, three and a half years later, I got a call from Tandy. He was in the hospital at uh, Virginia Mason in Seattle, and he wanted me to come visit. And the reason he was there was that Dr. Clurd, he had a cough, found a mass on the chest x-ray, went down to Virginia Mason to see if um, it was presumably lung cancer, and to get a biopsy, and to see if it was operable. And um, they asked him, uh, or they told him what was going to happen, the typical routine, standard stuff going to do a mediastinoscopy, open up the center here, and check for lymph nodes uh, to see if there was cancer there. If there was no cancer there, they tried to operate. If there was, it didn't make any sense to operate. He wanted to know if they are being truthful with him. Because many years earlier, decades actually, his sister had... Um, stomach cancer, and the family told the doctor, not Dr. Clear, it was another doctor, don't tell her, which was pretty standard in those days of doctors not telling, and uh, so the doctor did not. Now, he, he learned, of course, a lesson, a very bad lesson, that doctors lie, and how he wasn't sure they were lying to him. If they're being truthful, he trusted me to find out. And I told him they did tell him the truth. He died about six months later. I was at his deathbed. Um, but I think that was because of what I had done at that meeting of trusting him. He trusted me. Um, and that was the way I tried to be a physician um, at, on the Indian Reservation, is to trust the um, ultimate understanding of a people in a community that I could assist, but that I was not uh, knowledgeable enough to, nor should I, try to tell what to do. That would be supreme arrogance. Um, so I wasn't always successful at that. Surprise, surprise. Uh, I uh, didn't do everything perfect in my life. Uh, Sure, that's a shock to you, Joan. But, uh, <clears throat> but uh, it was my basic orientation um, that uh, they had strengths and resiliencies I could assist with, um, but I couldn't and shouldn't think I knew enough to tell them what was best for them. You've heard the joke, of course, about I'm from the government and. I'm here to help. Well, you know, it's from the government. Um, well, I was there to assist. And um, I learned uh, in relationship now to Primer um, some of the harms that came, not just individuals in research, but to communities, to the community themselves. Um, and uh, maybe later in, the, in this interview or the second interview, we can give details about that. But uh, um, when I was, after 13 years of being a practicing physician at the 
Lumbee Reservation, which is about 40 miles north of Swinomish. Um, they asked me to be director of research for IHS. Uh, <coughs> IHS did do research. It was, that's what the research program was about. Also funded research. Um, not to a huge amount, but somewhat. And we had no IRB. Now, this is in 1990, folks. Um, and so uh, uh, the head of the, uh, somehow I got involved with, uh, in contact with the head of the IRB, administrator of the IRB at uh, CDC, who said, you don't have an IRB? Do you know OH, OPRR? No. Do you read 45 C about 46? No. I think you need to speak to Charlie McCarthy. So I went to speak to Charlie McCarthy. He did not throw me or IHS in jail. Uh, he doesn't do that, as you know. Didn't do it then and doesn't do it now uh, when he had the authority to. But said, yeah, let's work together, get this solved. So he established an IRB. And one of the things he wanted, and we talked about the structure, and I won't go into details about that, but it was, it was a good, it was a pleasure to work with him. And I think he enjoyed it with me as well. He said, you know, you really need to pay attention to education of the IRB members. Okay. Um, so they were doing then, as they're doing now, um, programs funded, partially funded by OPRR, now OHRP, regional programs. And we said, let's uh, do one uh, devoted to issues around Indians. Uh, at the University of New Mexico um, uh, uh, Medical School as a co-planner um, with the Indian Health Service. And Charlie spoke, came to speak. Um, and, and he went long, be, be, as you know, just like me. He goes long beyond the allotted time to talk. But uh, that was okay. And... I talked about harms to communities, and that was the first he had heard of that. Um, and he said, yep, it makes sense to him. And he said, you know, that's, uh, it's not really in the regs. Um, they don't really pay attention to that very much at all. Um, but the regs are a floor, not a ceiling. You can do what you want uh, in that regard. So we did that every year. He also told me about Primer. Uh, so I, I forget which year. It was actually uh, almost, uh, it was probably 30 years ago, Joan. Uh, you, you, you shaved a few years off, I, I assume, uh, <laughs> uh, because you didn't want to think of it being that, that long. But it was about 30 years ago. And... Um, Excuse me, let me, 20 years ago, it was 1992, 1993, um, and went to Primer. And um, uh, as you know, sometimes I'd get up and make a comment on a presentation and talk about harms to communities. Um, so that's been a major issue uh, with me. And it turns out it's not only harms to Indian communities, um, and also benefits, potential benefits, potential harms. How do you deal with that to communities where it's not just the people involved in the research itself? Um, I've done presentations where I ask people, what do you think has been the research that has done the most harm in the United States in the past century? Um, and few people guess what I say. I, of course, there's no way of really what is the answer to that for sure. But it's IQ research, um, in my opinion, uh, because it stigmatized blacks and Indians and Hispanics and Jews, um, immigrant people. Um, uh, and... Uh, it didn't affect just those who took the IQ test, who were African American or whatever. It affected the whole community. Um, and so it's not just with Indians. But that 
issue about how to prevent harms to communities and research and still do the research um, and not, uh, not throw out the, the baby with the bathwater, as the saying goes, uh, um, because research is helpful and useful, is a, a major concern of mine. Um, but it all comes back to, I guess, to wrap up this long history, uh, assisting people as a pay forward uh, of people who don't have the, didn't have the benefit of the kind of family support, generational support um, that let me be who I was and accomplish what I did. Bill. Again, it's now the camera and the ages who see, who will see, why you've been a hero to so many of us. And hearing about your background and your journey really encapsulated the Belmont principles. You know, you are a seeker of justice, you are a practicer of beneficence, and you clearly have lived a life of respect for persons in the way you talked about your experience with the, the chairman, uh, Tandy was the embodiment of that in this past story. And I have so many follow-up questions. And the first among them is your, again, intuitive um, experience that led you to understand at a remarkably young age what cultural competence was and how you had to understand and respect people in order to get them to work with you and trust you. And if you were to try to summarize the most essential features of ways that cultural competence can be taught or learned or modeled, can you talk to me about that? Because again, it is your work in uh, Native American communities, African American communities, um, that has really characterized you as a leader in the field because it's so uncommon for someone who's Caucasian to really be trusted by and a leader in those communities. So I'd really like to know how you feel uh, current and future generations can learn about cultural competence if they were not as fortunate as you to have the role model you had in your father and to have had the experiences you had in the South, and then in Cartagena, and then in Vietnam, and certainly then on the reservations on which you worked. Well, uh, it's um, <clears throat> actually difficult for me to answer that. I'm not sure <clears throat> that my pathway um, necessarily, um, or my the path that I took, necessarily is what other people should do or that it has relevance. Uh, it, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, all I know is that, and don't ask me again why, because uh, I can't say what was, who taught me and what was taught. But it, the first thing is to listen. Um, and the second thing is to not be so arrogant. And that's a, it's a very strong term, but it's a term that lots of people have described, um, people from the majority society, lots of Indians um, have said that's how they come across, as they know what is good for us. It is not that they don't want to have assistance, um, but uh, it's um, don't be from the government and be there to help, which is, usually means there to direct, uh, <clears throat> in fact. Um, and um, I, 
I didn't always practice that. I, you know, uh, again, I've made mistakes. Uh, people have told me I've made mistakes. Uh, that I've come across that, like an East Coast arrogant SOB. Uh, and I had to pull back and say, whoops, uh, didn't want to do that. But it was a commitment. Um, maybe it was a, Joan, maybe it was a commitment to the idea that other people are valuable in themselves. And um, their value means I cannot say that they don't have value or that my skills and et cetera and knowledge have more value than they do. Um, it is not to say that I don't have those skills and knowledge, but it's just... Um, letting other people lead um, as opposed to direct them um, seems to go a long way. So I'd like to probe a little bit further um, into your story that when you spoke of community harms at the New Mexico meeting, the OPRR meeting, that was the first time that Charlie McCarthy, who was then head of OPRR, had heard of the term and the problem. And I'd love for you to tell me a little bit more about community harms. I mean, we're all familiar with stigmatization and dignitary harms, but I'd like you, again, uh, to talk about uh, what those mean to affected populations, to study populations, to vulnerable populations, because it's uh, your contribution to our field in that regard cannot be underestimated. So I'd like to hear more about it, please. Um, it, it should be, uh, the very first thing to say is that actually Bob Lamine talked about it in his 1986 book. So um, <clears throat> it, it, uh, this was not um, something that I originated. I, I may have thought of it without, I, I saw it later in, in Bob's book, but uh, you know, the, that book is, Pretty good, <laughs> as we all know. Um, but it's um, so that uh, the, the history of research with Indians, uh, American Indians, Alaska Native, Canadian First Nations people, um, and other indigenous people um, is um, in some ways you know, very similar to that with African Americans or um, other minority people. Uh, populations with less power. Uh, it's basically a power problem. Uh, and, um, but the, there were a total of three research projects, two of which are known widely. Uh, I know of a third one from having read the reports, the medical articles, that involved Indians in the 1950s that were um, certainly problematic ethically. won't need to talk about the third one, uh, but uh, when was the uh, uh, giving I-131, iodine, uh, radioactive iodine-131 um, to Alaska Native people um, to find out uh, did they have a different metabolism than us white Air Force people who are up in Fairbanks uh, at the air base and uh, Elmendorf uh, outside of Anchorage and you know this kind of stuff and also the army um, during of course the Cold War and you know being close to Russia and all that um, and uh, you know to uh, Alaska Native people didn't have the slightest idea what that was all about um, many didn't speak English three were breastfeeding. That hasn't been noticed uh, in the uh, what's been written about, and has anyone tried to follow up with the offspring? Um, it was uh, it was no different now than what we do with a thyroid scan, except it was a little bit more radiation back in those days. But um, and it turns out to be safe, but we didn't know it at the time. That's one. It was, it was uh, Institute of Medicine had a report about it. Uh, uh, been reported long before. Second one was the, the radiation experiments um, with the Navajo and uranium miners. Um, 
uh, both of those and the third one as well uh, in the 50s were where the protocol itself was the problem. In the sense, just like Tuskegee, it was the protocol it was the problem, problematic ethically. Ever since, with one exception, the problem has been at the point of dissemination, publication. So, there was the Barrow Alcoholism Study, where um, the results were released by uh, uh, university researchers of uh, how bad alcoholism was among the North Slope uh, Barrow, uh, Alaska. Um, the university was about 5,000 miles away uh, uh, on the eastern uh, coast of the United States, eastern region, uh, with a public announcement that made the New York Times. Um, and uh, one harm that, of people who know about that research was that the uh, North Slope was trying to um, get money on Wall Street for bonds, and the bond rating went down. What people don't know in general, uh, but I learned, is that the inhabitants, including outside of Beryl, outside of the study, to this day, feel self-stigmatized. We were bad people. Um, and that's literally what uh, uh, one elder, who was a teen at the time, said to me. Um, and so again, it was the dissemination and how it affected people when they were being talked about uh, as being defective, bad, whatever term you wanted to use, people. Um, another one uh, was a congenital syphilis study. Outbreak of congenital syphilis, public health problem. Um, uh, it was uh, reported, uh, not surprisingly, because that's how it happens, a breakdown of the medical care system. And it was reported, you know, what, what we can to reemphasize what we're supposed to do with uh, uh, testing uh, pregnant women. Um, and, uh, but it was uh, revealed the reservation. So uh, the kids, uh, uh, the off res white kids, taunted the Indian kids, your mom, your mom is a whore, right? Um, the gas, gasoline stations contributed uh, to the public health uh, efforts to uh, improve the public health by not permitting the Indians to use the toilets in the gas stations because syphilis is passed by toilet seats, right? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, the, uh, there are several uh, examples of where the, uh, the way things were published or announced or disseminated was stigmatizing. Um, and the problem was pretty obvious in terms of, okay, contributing to or strengthening the anti-Indian prejudice, um, especially around reservations or in certain states. But it was also what I kept on hearing from people was the self-stigmatization, uh, that we're bad people. The one exception you've probably heard about, it includes this one, by the way, um, was a Havasupai. It was also in the dissemination. They had one about, um, the study was about uh, inbreeding. Um, and it was a term, of course, that uh, um, was a, a technical term but when said in plain English was, you know, you, your people are marrying their relatives. Well, in a small reservation, actually, that's, that does happen. Um, but it was uh, in a way that was seen as, um, you know, that, that's not kosher, I guess, <laughs> would be the term. Um, um, uh, th there has been... Um, then more recently, including Havasupai, but also in Canada, um, 
use of genetic specimens that were gathered in one kind of research to do another kind of research without the tribe's permission. Uh, that's what happened in Havasupai, it was uh, these specimens were to learn about the genetics of diabetes. The Havasupai had a high problem with diabetes. Um, but it was used for all sorts of other things. Um, and so, um, the, the genetic specimen turns out to be Indians aren't all that different than the rest of us. Uh, or to put it another way, the rest of us are not all that different than Indians. Um, in terms of what they want to have, what kind of control they want over their specimens. Larry Burke's uh, research uh, and many other people's research of people who actually have given specimens because they believe in the research, but then when asked, well, do you, can we just go ahead and use them and, and form you later on the purposes we want? No way. Um, they want to be, have a say, give permission uh, or consent, as the case may be. I mean, that's the American way. Uh, and it's not a whole lot different for mainstream than for Indians. Um, but in, in terms of the stigma, and, and one of the reasons is probably is, is indeed the stigmatization. There was the issue with the, um, uh, boy, I'm forgetting how to, the, the BRCA1 variant that was found in the Ashkenazi Jews. Um, and uh, the public press included a Jewish gene for cancer headlines, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, the ancestor of the National Human Genome Research Institute was very concerned about that, met with uh, various Jewish uh, communities in the eastern part of the United States. Uh, but one said, we don't want to participate. Um, I think you're probably close to where you live. Uh, as I recall. So um, the, those are the kinds of concerns that people have. And um, I guess I consistently fall back on um, what I, I call a, a cross-cultural way of looking at things. And, and actually, I think when you ask about cultural competence, to, if you think cross-culturally, it, it helps, I think, to be culturally competent. Of course, how to think cross-culturally. What well, comes first, the chicken egg, I don't know. But um, Coletta Toulouse, two, I think it was two years ago, um, spoke here at Primer here in San Diego um, and told a story about how to soup by. One of the things I don't think, I don't recall she said um, in her presentation, but she had said elsewhere, and it's been written up, that the specimens uh, were people, some alive, some people still alive, some not, but that their spirits were locked in a cooler. And scientists, some, have extreme difficulty thinking of that. How can anyone think that? Well, at the same presentation was a woman, and I forget the disease her two twins, I think, had, um, that results in death, I think, generally around by age 10 or something. I mean, just wait, really. And she led the fight, uh, the effort, to get... Uh, she's a lay person, but a mom, uh, head of an advocacy organization, to get other families with this disease in the family to get a, to donate specimens as well as take histories so that they could find the gene. And she talked, she had a picture of a incubator the glass door so you could see inside, and there were two petri dishes. 
I don't get the names of her daughters, but I'll make them up, uh, Amy and Mary. That's Amy on the right. And that's Mary on the left. Now, here's a woman, not Indian, right? Steeped in science, a lay person. Those genetic specimens that were on perpetual cell lines growing were her kids. Same difference. Um, the MIA, missing in action, issues with the whole U.S. society. Need to get those bodies back. No different than the Havasupai. So, um, the ability to hear what they're saying and not to disparage it because it's not the way we scientists think of DNA. I mean, I think of DNA like a scientist, but I can also think of it as Amy and Mary or spirits locked in the cooler. Just like the, the bones in Vietnam or Korea are those people that we need to get back. Um, and I think it is possible to honor and respect and encourage, I'm not quite sure of the word I'm searching for, but um, both the science and the scientific way of thinking, as well as how many of us, even scientists, when it comes down to someone in the family dying, actually feel. So. Many believe that Belmont, that the principles are still valid, still strong, still applicable, but we need to add at least one or two more. And one of those that people feel is missing and should be considered for addition is that of community consent. And that reflects the cross-cultural nature of research uh, growing by the day, given the international, um, the locus of most research being international or in um, different cultural minorities in our own country. And you've done so much work with um, community-based participatory research with community consent. You've told us about respectful listening and abandoning the arrogance and abandoning the disparaging remarks. I would just like to know your thoughts about how to best move forward with community consent and community-based participatory research, and if you think it's already making a difference. Oh, I think it is certainly making a difference um in, in a wide number of communities. I mean, uh, <clears throat> breast cancer research, uh, um, some of it is really CBPR uh, because of breast cancer advocates. You've got the um, genetic disease communities, the rare genetic disease communities, um, or rare disease communities, uh, um, uh, where because they control, have some control, and not necessarily absolute, but some control over what is done and how. They're able to get from worldwide, using the web, histories and specimens of huge, relatively huge numbers of people in very rare diseases. So it's not just Indians. The, CBPR and research that is done by Indians. By the way, not all research done by Indians is necessarily um, precisely what Indian communities want. Surprise, surprise. Um, but uh, it's closer in general. But it's, um, there is less distrust of research in Indian communities, more willingness to um, work with research and on 
very significant issues. Uh, there are three research projects that I am helping to support, uh, NIH funded, but it comes through the Northwest Indian College, um, on substance and alcohol abuse. Um, unlike Barrow, alcoholism study, um, the, the tribes are involved in planning it, tribal people are involved in planning it, um, and how it's going to be reported, so that it can be reported um, this is probably going to be a conversation for, for installment too, but you can talk about the pathology, as they did in Barrow, of the community. Or you can talk and do research on strengths and resiliencies. What about all the people who don't drink? Um, who were raised in families where everyone else was an abuser of drugs or alcohol, and they are not. How does that happen? What can we learn from that? It turns out, by the way, that um, Indians have a higher percentage of Indians are abstainers than in the white population. By far. It's not just a little bit. I mean, we're talking about big time. Because difference. Um, but there's also then another population where binge drinking and heavy drinking as opposed to social drinking and relatively few social drinkers. So it's a U-shaped curve. Um, understanding that um, and talking about the efforts that tribal communities and individuals are doing to... Uh, to learn from the resiliencies and strengths in their communities and trying to expand that. Also then is a way of saying there are strengths and resiliencies. These are strong communities in spite of all that's going on. Um, and that is a, has a whole different meaning than in terms of the stigmatization. It's no longer stigmatizing it is still looking at the very same, quote, problem, but from a different perspective. Um, and I don't think anyone really wants to not look at the problems, um, but uh, do it in a way that, that reflects that, that strength and resiliency. To bring this um, section or installment to a close, I would like to ask a conclusory question, a summary question about this part of our discussion. And that is, if you, having seen so much and been involved in so much research in the American Indian, Alaskan Native, Canadian First Nations, Inuit peoples, uh, communities, if you could wave a magic wand and influence a major change in how research is conducted in those communities and other vulnerable populations without regard, at least for purposes of this interview, to the need for resources, what would you wish for? Uh, in other words, how would you finish the sentence, if only? Well, um, <clears throat> Maybe it's um, it's pie in the sky or something. Um, it is if only researchers listened to the people they're researching and to the concerns of the people that they are researching, and to the communities in which the people reside. Um, I think the research would be scientifically much better, more relevant. Um, it would be if they're not just listening, but also partnering, or getting back to community-based participatory research, partnering research. Um, it would um, help deal with uh, and actually encourage people to participate in the research. Um, there's more to science than the 
technical. Um, and um, how to get there? You asked me that before, cultural competence. Uh, and, but um, yeah, it would be if we could do that, if we could listen to each other respectfully, uh, value each other, um, I think things would, they're already improving. That's happening. And it was never that it never happened, but it uh, tended to not happen to vulnerable, less powerful people <coughs> and communities. Maybe we'd, <coughs> we would increase the, I think, the value of the research scientifically as well as to the communities um, and result in, <coughs> excuse me, a, a lot less um, distrust and uh, ignoring of research by the people who ultimately have to be the ones to make the changes that we learn from research. Before we conclude, is there anything you'd like to add or revisit or emphasize? Our time is short, but I would welcome any concluding comments you'd like to make for this part of our well, I, I, I want to add one thing, um, and it's re related to what I've been saying. As you know, I'm a kidney donor. I think we'll probably talk a little bit more about that in the uh, next uh, installment. A living kidney donor, non-directed. And I learned a lot um, of doing that. First of all, uh, I mean, it's an incredible experience. Um, and with incredible science behind it, and incredible doctors um, uh, that I had. Uh, there were also some problems. And one of the things um, in relevance to research is that both in kidney donation too often and in research, uh, we don't think about harms potential harms as longer term, medium term and longer term. And minimizing potential harms means being responsible for the harms that may occur to living kidney donors or living organ donors who are doing undergoing surgery for someone else. It's the only surgery the only surgery where that's done. Um, but that's very much like research, isn't it? Research asks people to give their time and effort and maybe a little bit of risk. Well, there's always a little bit of risk, but sometimes significant risk for other people's benefit. Um, and yet um, we in both cases, I think, do not think about or take seriously that there may be longer term issues and what is the responsibility of the medical care system or of the research system. Um, I um, didn't and still don't have any appreciable medical problems from my donation. Um, and most important, by the way, is not that, but that the, uh, the recipient, who I finally did meet uh, 15 months later, uh, although we communicated uh, for several months, um, uh, she and her, it's no longer a new used kidney, now it's a teenage used kidney, four years later, are getting along well together. She talks to it. <laughs> uh, I, I probably would, you know, talking about that's Mary and you know Amy. Yeah, but if I had a transplanted kidney, I'd probably be talking to it too. You know, that's what you <laughs> what you think about. Uh, but they're getting along well together. Um, that's the name of the game. Um, but there are kidney donors, living kidney donors, 
who have not been so fortunate in terms of what's happened to them. There are people in research who also have not, it's not been a fortunate experience, or as, as fortunate as it could be. And um, I think it's very similar. And I think there's some implications of what they're doing both, that they can cross fertilize each other. I guess that's what I'm working on nowadays. Thank you, Bill. I am so grateful that so many other people will hear your story because you shared it here with us today. And in a world where there's such a dearth of mentors and role models and leaders, your integrity and your pursuit of justice, your compassion and your kindness, your brilliance, and your incredible gifts to the communities with which you've worked are um, ones that need to be told over and over and heard over and over, and that's what this project's about. So on behalf of your many, many, many friends and admirers at Primer with me, at or at least near the top of the list, I thank you for sitting down with me today for part one. I'm sure we could have on Beyond Zebra many, many parts, but at least we'll look forward to part two and see where we go from there. So thank you, Bill. Thank you for your kind of words. That's an Indian saying.